it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. God is good. All and all the time. <laughs> Thank you for coming out on this Valentine's Day. I want to welcome everybody tuning in on Facebook, YouTube, all those sitting by the phones and the televisions. Welcome. Thanks for being here. I hope you enjoyed that worship, that, that last song, right? There's nothing. There's nothing better than you. Not your house, not your car. You know, not your friend, not even you. That's the hard one to grasp, right? That, amen. Right? You're not even better than him. He's just, just amazing. That just was such a good time of worship, and I'm thankful for that. Got just some few announcements. I want to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day, right? This is the day we're supposed to say, I love you, right? To all your loved ones, and, and uh, I love you all. You guys are a blessing. Every single one of you have brought so much joy to my life. Just Crazy people coming out, letting this kid from Brooklyn stand up here and talk to you. You all got problems, is all I got to tell you. We're thankful. <laughs> and beginning with Marvin. So just so everybody knows, he's the top of the list. But I really am thankful to be here. And I'm so thankful that uh, you guys are such a loving church, you know. We celebrate Valentine's Day every time we get together in here, don't we? That's an amazing Place of love. Uh, I want to welcome all the guests. If there are any in here, enjoy yourself. Um, experience the presence of God. I want to thank everybody for the generosity. I know we just had an offering video. Um, my Lord, I've been here not a year yet, and you guys are some of the most generous people I've ever truly met. We've done more during this COVID than some people do without a COVID. We had a woman that we found that was on the street that needed a place and we didn't just give her a place. We found her a home to live in, got her furniture. Um, she's got a stable environment. She's not going from one hotel to another. And, and that's because of your generosity. You guys all made it possible through your giving and your willingness to sacrifice and give things up. And just, just amazed when I think about, you know, when it's time for offering. And I wonder if people really know what's happening, you know, behind the scenes with that money. Misty Hamrick, our compassionate ministry leader, just is doing such a good job trying to get that thing off the ground, caring about people in our community. Right. Doing a great job. They're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. And the other thing is, we have another trailer right now. Somebody, in, through their generosity, and donated a mobile home to the church. And somebody had a spot for it to go, donated the spot for it to stay. And we have this opportunity to find someone else or other people as time goes by that, that, for whatever reason, we haven't even truly figured out what that ministry is going to ultimately be. But we know it's going to be something, and it's possible because of you guys and your generous giving. You guys are awesome. You should be glad and happy that God opened your eyes one day and, and taught you and showed you the, the, the blessing in being generous, you know, and this is awesome. And um, I know we don't take an offering here. I'm just, well, I'm not starting my sermon yet. I just want to brag on you guys. I mean, we haven't taken an offering in this place since I've been here. And everything's still getting done. Everything's still getting paid. You guys are just, it takes special person to get up before or after with nobody asking you to put some money in a plate. That's just amazing. I, not many places like that. If you don't pass that plate, you can go broke, you know? So just, just want to love on you guys and just brag on what God's doing in your life and in this church. Amen? Amen. And I want to brag on one more thing. We have a baptism next week. <laughs> Amen. Been here less than a year. We got another day of baptism. I just love it. That's what the church is supposed to be doing, right? Finding people, connecting them to Jesus to such an extent that they're ready to get, ba get baptized and give their life over to Jesus completely. So next week, come on out and celebrate with them. And if you haven't been baptized and you really want to get your life right with Jesus and you've been living on the edge and it's, it's about time you, you do it right, you, you talk to me or any one of these leaders, we can put you on that list and, and get you baptized too. It's, it's, it's the first act of obedience. It's what we do is repent and baptized. It's just something we've been doing for 2,000 years, and we continue on that, that sacrament of baptism. With that being said, um, for the people online that can't baptize you, you got to get in here. <laughs> just trying to say, unless you can do this while everybody going into baptistry, you can get in your bathtub or something like that. And, and, uh, 
<laughs> there's limitations to social media, and there there's limitations. With that being said, let's let's move on. If you got your Bibles with you this morning, let's give our confession of faith in the Word of God and repeat after me that this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. And my heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. If you will turn with me in your Bible, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. And we're going to do what we can maybe to wrap up this series this morning on this letter, asking the question, are you sure? And today we're going to ask the question, what is it that you love on this Valentine's Day? Um, when all God's people are there, Stephanie will say amen. That's a tradition here. It started some months back. So everybody's waiting on Stephanie. Or if you're not with her, you're falling behind. You good? All right. First John chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Father, I thank you for this morning and this time together as always. And I ask, Lord, Father, as I've been asking all week, all day, all morning, that your Holy Spirit would move and it would have, and you would have your way. Then when it's all said and done, that Jesus would be glorified. We would see him for who he is. <laughs> we would see the hope that we have that's in him and him alone. Help us, Father. Assure us this morning. Have your way. It's in your name we pray. And all God's children that agreed said, amen, amen and amen. Um, as I was sharing, we're going to be wrapping up First John this morning um, for a number of reasons. I, I know some might be asking the question, how do you wrap it up? You're still only in chapter two. Well, the reality is they're all the same. There's one, there's one big idea from chapter one all the way to chapter four. It's not chronological where he deals with one thing, chapter one, and there's another thing in chapter two, kind of like Romans or, you know, some of the other letters that are written. He's, he goes back and forth from chapter to chapter trying to make one big point. And that's how that you know that you know that you know that your faith in Christ is genuine and real. How can you tell? And so you could, you could just stay in the first two chapters and jump back and forth with him because uh, he, he's making the point throughout the whole letter. He's not making a bunch of different points. So we really did cover everything, hopefully, today. The other reason why we're wrapping it up is next week starts a new season in the church, and that's called the season of Lent. We celebrated this year the season of Advent where the church stops four weeks before Christmas, where we focus on the coming of Christ and why he was born and what he came to do and that he was king and Lord. And on those four weeks before Christmas, we, we focus on all of those important things on why Jesus had to be born. Lent is a little different. Lent is a 40-day journey up until the cross where the church stops and reflects upon everything that Jesus said and taught. And what does it mean to me? And what does it mean to you? And how am I supposed to respond to the very things that Jesus was saying? It's 
It's a 40 day journey. It actually starts on Wednesday. The church has been doing this for a while. A lot of churches have lost the seasons, as we had shared with you, that we forgot that we have these times and the reason we have these times. And I'll remind you next week is because we forget very, very quick. I mean, you can go to some churches out there and just be there for a while. And you really don't know what the story is because they're all over the place. If you follow the seasons, you can't help but, but stop and say, what did Jesus say? Why did he come? What kind of life did he live? What does it mean to me? Because Easter is awesome. But you can't have Easter without the crucifixion. And you don't have the crucifixion without Passion Week. And you don't have Passion Week until you you see him baptized by John in in in, in the Jordan. So there's a lot of things that hopefully and pray that God leads us through through this time. And I want to share that with the church, even though I'm stopping at chapter 2. But with that being said, in order to conclude this letter, I was really kind of struggling yesterday. Actually, I've been struggling every week how to start this thing off. Um, I've been sharing that with you. And I praise the Lord for my wife. She's good. We're driving in the car and I just get to chat with her back and forth trying to figure out how to do this. And um, I concluded that in order to wrap this up, uh, to get the whole big picture, that we really learn one of two things. In the scriptures, really what we've learned. Uh, we've learned, one, that it is possible to think that you're going to heaven or to think that you know God. It's possible to believe that you're in the faith and be wrong. It's possible to believe that you think that you know God and you really don't. And this is kind of what the letter is about. <laughs> Actually, on the other hand, it's kind of a two-sided coin. On one hand, you can think you're in the faith and you're not. On the other hand, there are certain litmus tests and things that you can see in your life to help assure you that you know, that you know, that you know, that you are in the faith. That you, your faith in Christ isn't futile. Something has happened and, and something really is happening. And I know that's tough. I, I know to sit up here and to say to the church and to people watching and listening that it is possible that what you think is real about Jesus isn't and you're not born again. I know it's 2021. I just made an absolute. I just got crazy because everybody that believes in Jesus is going to go to heaven, right? I mean, every funeral, somebody's going to heaven. And I've seen some people in the funerals. I'm not too sure. We live in a world where everything is acceptable. We've turned the church and just to make everybody happy, you, you know, don't, 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 don't get too crazy. But it's, understand, don't get mad at me because I didn't say these things. John did. John was the one that says, if you claim to be in the light, yet walk in darkness, you lie. I didn't say that. I just read it for you. John is the one that says, if you claim to be without sin, you make him out to be a liar because you are. It was John that said, if you don't love your brother, the love of the father is not in you. It's not me. It's what he was saying in this letter. And I know we don't like it, but the reality is it is possible to to think you're in the faith and not be. And I don't say that to scare you, to, to make everybody worried, because at the same time, it's also possible to know that you are in the faith, that he, he doesn't just say you, you, you're not in. He says, listen, if you see these things in your life and they're, they're evident, you, you can be assured, you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you have eternal life. It's something you possess, you will live forever. He begins the letter out like what we read this morning. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven. He's talking to people that know they're right. I write these things to you, fathers, because you've known him from the beginning. You, you've overcome the evil one. He's, he's beginning to assure them that they've overcome the evil one. And why is it that we could think we believe and, and be wrong? I've shared that too, right? That there is really a devil. He hates you. Hates me. He lied to Adam. He lied to Eve. They believed him. He lied to you. He lies to me. And man, if we're not we're not careful, we'll believe him too. We got to reject him. Kind of like in in Sunday school in Cece's class the morning this morning they were talking about the full armor of God. And the first one is what you got to put on truth. 
You got to know what's real. You got to know what's right. And we're living in a world today where no, there is no truth. What's your truth? And your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. And I'm telling you, there is only one truth. Amen. Only one. So if I'm wrapping this up, we're dealing with the fact that how do we know we're in the faith? Or what are the, what are the evidences that we have if we're in the faith? And to truly get it, let me take you back a little bit to why the letter is written in the first place. You see, there was, I shared this week one. There were some people we called that were Gnostics. They, they, it was this, this teaching called Gnosticism. It still goes around today. Gnosticism has many different shapes and flavors. And it has developed over the years into a lot of different things. But at the core of Gnosticism is that God is dark and mysterious and you can't know him. And it takes a special revelation. And John is dealing with that by saying, no, God is not dark. God is light. And you can know him. We've seen him. We've touched him. It's Jesus. And to know the father is to know the son. And to know the son is to know the Father. So he deals with that. No, you can know who God is, and you know it when you look at Jesus. If you deny Jesus is the Christ, you're the Antichrist, and your faith is futile. So if Jesus isn't your number one, if Jesus isn't the center of your life, your mind, your faith, your religion, you might be struggling with reality. Because Jesus is everything. Jesus is always going to be everything. And Jesus always was everything. He was that which was from the beginning. And he'll be that which is in the end. And somewhere in the middle, we fall in between. And we either embrace Jesus for who he is. Or we don't. And he just becomes your best friend. Or he becomes that really nice guy that you go to. And you, you put some money in the machine. And just hope a piece of candy comes out. And he gives you a blessing. Or it can be the very center of who you are. And he gives us some litmus tests. He says, now you know you're in the faith. You're living like you believe Jesus really is the Christ. You're putting your money where your mouth is. And then he says, the people and those Gnostics didn't also believe that we couldn't know God. But that sin wasn't real. The world itself was evil, but not us. Because the world, and they had a lot of different ways and reasons they came to these conclusions. Because like I said, there's different types of Gnosticism. But really the most common is this world is an accident. There was a battle. And in this battle in the heavenly realms, the world was created. It wasn't supposed to be here. So it's, it's bad. It's evil. This pulpit is evil. This book is evil. The very existence of the trees is evil. But your behavior is not. There's, there's no such thing as evil behavior, but it's an evil world that shouldn't be. And he deals with that. And when he says, if you claim to be out without sin, you make him out to be a liar. There is a such thing as sin. And there is a right and wrong. <laughs> and we struggle with getting it right and wrong at some times. And he, he uses that. And he says, listen, how do you know if you're living like you believe Jesus is real? And Jesus really is who he said he was? You're living a life of confession because sin breaks your heart. You realize it for what it is. You see for how bad it is, you know? So when you find yourself in it, what do you do? You confess your sins to who? To Jesus. Why? Because who we believe he is. The atoning sacrifice for us. The advocate who is with the Father. You, you know what I'm saying? You go to him, forgive me. <laughs> we were in class this morning. I, oh man, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure who really said it. But it was, it was anyway, I won't call out anybody's names. Because you may make someone feel bad. But she was like, I, I get up in the morning and I thank God for life. And I ask him, forgive me for what I'm going to do for the rest of the day. She was, she was preparing ahead of time. It was almost like, God, I'm ready to walk outside right now. So please forgive me. Because I have a feeling I might do something. I mean, it's a sign that you understand the depth and the pain that sin causes. And our need for redemption and our need for grace. If that's part of your life, then, then yeah, that's a good test. If, if sin doesn't bother you and you're just like, nah, I do what I want to do when I, have, I want to do it, I, that's not a good sign. And remember, don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what he says in this letter. You know, who wrote this letter, right? John, the guy who wrote the gospel of John, 
The one who's seen Jesus walk on water, the one who was there when he was transfigured, the one that's seen him raise people from the dead, give sight to the blind. Him, that guy. Not a friend of a friend of a friend. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't repeating what someone else told him what Jesus said. He, he's saying, this is what I've seen and what I've touched and what I've heard. We're getting firsthand information here. It's good stuff. Scary stuff. Because it actually means that Christianity might require something from you. Ooh. No, grace is free. Grace don't cost you nothing. Just believe it. I feel like I'm in the 60s, but I wasn't really old enough to run around in the 60s and everything's just love. No, no, grace requires a whole lot. It requires you presenting yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, right? And therefore, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's grace, you give yourself right back to God. You don't ask him to come into your life. You give him yours. Don't come hang out with me, Jesus, because where I'm going, you don't want to be. I want to give you my life because I want to go where you're going. So I'm trying to wrap it up. We live a life of obedience. And then ultimately, what did we say last week? It's a life that begins to look like Christ. Why? Because we've been born again. At the heart of Christianity, this isn't a religion. There's another thing I was talking to my friend about and I was talking to my wife about. I said, I feel like I keep bringing up the same basic stuff that everybody should know. And, you know, like, well, maybe not. You know, maybe everyone doesn't know it. Or, or if you don't know all of the story, then Christianity just becomes a moral code of things you're supposed to do and things you're not supposed to do. And that saves nobody. Right? Has anyone been there? You started, you got born again in the middle of life and you go to church and you're trying to start <laughs> from the beginning, but you're hearing the middle of the story. It's like picking up a book at chapter 10 and starting to read it. It's like sitting down in the house watching a television show or a movie that someone is already watching. And you're trying to figure out what in the world is going on. But all you hear is don't do this and don't do that. And you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that. So you, you make your list and you, you try to pull it off. And you find out that you can't pull it off because you've never been born again. The reason these things are pieces of evidence is because they're only possible when you've been born again. It's only possible when you've be re re been regenerated, when the Holy Spirit comes in your life. So he's confident to be and be able to say, obedience, yes. Christ-likeness, yes. Loving your neighbor, yes. You can tell when you see that in your life, you know you've overcome the evil one. Because if the evil one is still ruling and reigning, you can care about, less about doing what's right. You can care less about loving your neighbor because all you love is who? yourself so he says these are some tests these are some litmus tests and then it gets really crazy today and he says do not love the world or anything in it <laughs> anyone ever actually listened and thought about that do not love the world or anything in the world <laughs> because everything in this world is not from the father if you love it, the love of God is not in you. That was messing with me, especially how to communicate that, because it's Valentine's Day. We're supposed to love stuff today, aren't we? We're supposed to love our wives, our family, our kids. And the reality is I do love my wife. Adore her. She's everything to me. You guys, I love you guys, like big time. Is he telling me I'm not supposed to like Bill? It's all right if you tell me not to like Marvin. <laughs> all right, forgive me, Lord, forgive me. But am I supposed to not love my kids? What about this world? What is it I'm not supposed to love? What is he talking about? Because he does tell us in here, what? That we're supposed to love our neighbor. But now he's saying, don't love the world. And Jesus loved the world, that he died for the world. And so there's this little confusion going on in there in my head. And I, how do you unpack that to the church? How do you unpack that to the born-again believer? I'm sitting here, and Janan and I are in the car, and she shared some of the things that we kind of love. 
And one of the things we love since we moved here is I get up in the morning and we go sit outside and we drink coffee. And she says, as we watch the sunrise, right? And I was, in, I was like, yeah, I do enjoy that. But it's not really completely true because I don't get up early enough to see the sunrise. She's the one out here looking at the sunrise. I'm still in bed. After the sun rises, I crawl out of my bed and I sit there and I drink coffee with her. And I like looking at the squirrels. We got a family of squirrels out there, about four or five of them. I, I, don't, I don't know. I wish I could put a little collar on them and name them because they come out and they're not afraid of us. They walk around and they're picking up all the pecans and they're chasing themselves around the tree. And I love just sitting there and watch them. Sometimes they get up on the windowsill while I'm watching TV and the window's right there and he's just standing there. And I don't want to move because I don't want to scare him. I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I really do. We got some birds that come around and they, they're picking up worms or whatever that they're trying to do to, to eat by a living. Other than one bird. This one bird, I don't like him. He, he, he's been landing on the mailbox and leaving me some gifts on top of it. I don't love that world. I'm struggling with loving on that. There's things in this world that are lovable, aren't there? I mean, come on now. Well, I love vacation. I love relaxing. I love my family. I just love this. I mean, there's so much to love, but here he is. He's in my face, and he's saying, don't love the world. Well, here's the thing. I believe when we're born again, truly, in the, and we will get in the word of God, and we start walking with the Holy Spirit, we begin to see some things that we didn't see before about this world. We begin to, one, understand that this world wasn't created the way it is today. That this world was created good and perfect and holy and spotless. And it wasn't created by accident the way the Gnostics and the heres the, the, those that were dealing with heresy were saying that this world was created intentional by God orderly and after each stage of creation he stopped and he looked at it and he said that's good exactly the way I wanted it nothing wrong it's working and flowing appropriately it's good and then day two and then day three and day four even up to the fact when he took man and he took Eve and he created what he said what I created man in my image male and female I'm creating them both and we were created in his image holy and perfect and spotless and we walked with God, trusted in God, received everything that we needed from God. He was our provider, our protector, protection. He was our everything. You didn't have to get up and wonder if you were going to be able to find food today. It was always going to be there. You didn't have to worry whether you were going to get the COVID because you were going to be healthy all the time. There was no death. There was no sin. There was no pain. It was paradise. The garden. That's how God created this world. You have to remember that because if you don't start there, you'll never figure out what's going on now. The world was created good. It wasn't until the evil one and, and Adam and Eve kind of got duped by the evil one, rebelled against God, and then everything changed. Sin entered the world. And this good world has been changed. You have been changed. I have been changed. The goodness of this world has been changed. And now we're standing in between this time between good and, and the time between evil. And you just never know where it's going to land today. For some of us, it's landed in the good part for most of our lives. We've always had a place to live. We've always had a place to sleep. We've always had something to eat. We've always had more than the next guy. We've been blessed. But for some of the people, that's not how it was born for them. They were born in poverty. They were born in, in a messed up home. Mom was an alcoholic. Dad was a drug addict. Or they just didn't care about their kids. Either way, you, you could have been born in Africa. You could have been born in India. There are so many different lots that humankind is in. And some good and some bad. And it wasn't intended to be that way. But that's the way it is now. And I don't love that world. Because something that was good turned into something that could be pretty bad. 
And even though your life was always good and, and hunky-dory, understand that the hardest days you ever had is nothing compared to some other people. Nothing. We should be ashamed at times when we had to skip a breakfast or, or, or we got stuck in traffic. And the sinful nature is a mess about the things that, that mess with us. But there are some people, when I look at their life, I'm just like, whew, I'm not complaining ever again. Because if I do, he might just strike me dead. Thank you, Lord, for the life that you've given me. Because it could change really, really fast. I don't love that word. I have a problem with that one. That world's an issue to me. A world that has... Some of this stuff is easy. Atom bombs, nuclear bombs, hydrogen bombs. We live in a world that some people had to invest all kinds of money to create a weapon that will annihilate everybody just to make sure that somebody doesn't come in and take what we have. I mean, what's the point of the bomb? Is to keep another nation from saying, you know, <laughs> I might just want to dominate that nation and take all their resources and, and take anything they had. So what did we have to do? We've had to protect ourselves and, and build bombs and armies and, and spend all kinds of money just to make sure. I don't like that world. I don't love that world at all. I have a problem with that world. I do. And, and the reality is, if you're born again, and the Holy Spirit's moving in your life, and you're growing into Christ-likeness, you don't like that world either. Because if you're embracing that world, you're missing something. You're missing something, because that's not how it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to have armies. Janan and I went to Mobile, Alabama yesterday, and I, what did I do? There. there you go. Something wrong here. Either way. But I went to, went to Mobile. I put my gun on me. Why? Because I don't want somebody to take something that I have. And what if that? What if Haji shows up? I mean, you know, he hasn't been around in about four years. He's due to start shooting some stuff up if you pay attention to history. I don't want to be in that mall when somebody starts shooting the place up and not be able to protect my family. I don't like that world. I don't like that world at all. I struggle with the reality that I have to do that. Another one. This one's a little bit. This one's a little bit tougher. I'm just going to paint the picture of the problem of what we're not supposed to love. It happened a few years back when Trump got elected, and it's happening again. And listen, do not get political on me because this has nothing to do with politics. This has to do with the world that we live in. I feel bad that I have to make that disclaimer because we're so politically paralyzed anymore. And right now, you just say anything and you immediately categorize who I am or what I believe or what I think. And I hate to tell you, they're all going to hell. How's that? The Republicans are lost as can be. And the Democrats are as lost as can be. They're just lost in two different ways. But they're lost. Only Jesus is the true king. Only the kingdom of God really matters. The world and its desires are passing away. There's a new kingdom coming. And that's what I'm focused on. But, but if I'm going to focus on that kingdom, we have to deal with this issue. And this issue is there are people that have so little. So little. They have no hope for tomorrow. That their only hope is to pack up, put some shoes on, and start walking this way. That's crazy. Walk across the tip. Have you ever seen how long Mexico is? It's so bad in Guatemala and Honduras or wherever it is they're coming from that they have no hope for tomorrow. None. So the only, only hope they have is I'm going that way. Maybe they'll let me in. And maybe I'll have a better shot at tomorrow. Because I know if I stay here, it's going to be bad. I don't like that world. I don't like that world at all. I don't like the world that we even have to be afraid of letting them in because we don't know who we're letting in. I don't like that world either. Now, some people have said to me, and rightfully so, you know, they're coming here for all the free stuff. Well, yeah. Why else would they walk across a nation to go to another nation? 
But here's what I want you to understand. Right now, if you found out in, that in, in Canada, you're going to get free medical. You never have to pay for a medical bill ever again. They'll give you a place to live. Nothing real special. You'll be able to eke out, you know, basic. You know, just enough to survive. Just enough to eat. You can have no luxuries. Just enough to survive. How many people are ready to start walking over there with me? Why not? It's free. I'll tell you why. Because you have everything that you need. You can't even relate to what's going on in their head. And then what else I hate? That we had to turn it into a political issue. <laughs> you had to be either on one side or the other. And I'm saying like both sides are just completely wrong. We're living in a lost and broken world. And we need Jesus to come back and to fix something. That's the world we're not supposed to love. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Because it's a mess. It's not working the way it's supposed to work. It's fallen. The devil's everywhere. And it's not just his fault. It's yours and mine. Because it's the lust of the eyes. And the lust of the flesh. That doesn't come from the Father. How does that? Because there are people in Honduras or Guatemala that have a whole lot, but they can't share it. There are people in this country that have a whole lot, just can't share it. We just can't do it. We just, it's just not possible. I shared a video. Um, <laughs> to a few people the other day through instant messenger. And it was a prayer group. There was a bunch of Christians around praying that God would help the poor. True story. I understand it to everyone, but those that got it know what I'm talking about. And they're praying, Lord God, please help the poor. They need you. They're broke. They got stuff. And then all of a sudden, a light from heaven shone. And God's voice showed up. He said, thanks for asking. Go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And there was a pause, and they all looked at each other and said, The devil's here! And they all ran out of the building, and they claimed that the voice was from the devil. And I remember Jesus' voice telling somebody to do the same, didn't he? There are people with billions. Billions. I can't even wrap my mind around billions. And will die with billions. Billions. And there's people walking across the nation. And we're arguing whether they should come in here or not. You got billions. How much do you need? How much do you have to die with? We're talking about billions. How many you got a whole lot more? You know you're going to die and there's going to be a whole lot left over. How much do you need? I don't love that world where we're not sure how much we need. You see what I'm saying? I'm not saying it's wrong to have a billion. But how much of that billion do you really need? Uh, you might make how much you have in your account. What, how much do you really need? I don't love that world. I love that. I hate that struggle of trying to figure out how much do I need? Do I need more? Well, yeah. Is it only me that wants just a little more? I'm not the only one here could want. Is it me? I'm the only one going to hell, right? I, did, I want a little more. I love that world, that I can't be satisfied with what we have. I watched a video on Netflix one day. I'll get to the good news here in a minute. Hold on. There's some good news in here. I was watching this video on Netflix about billionaires. And I'm not picking on billionaires. Just trying to show you the world that we live in and why we're not supposed to love it. And it tried to compare the life of what it is to be a billionaire with a regular person. Because we cannot fathom what it's like to be a billionaire. And they said for a billionaire to rent the jet, and fly anywhere in the world. Let's say that you're going to go to, I don't know, what you say, France to get cheese. And I, don't know, I know they don't make French fries in France. But, you know, you just, you just fly all the way there to get yourself a sandwich. And you fly back that same day. It's the same as if someone just gets in a taxi cab and goes to the McDonald's, or you call the Uber. I know there's no Uber out here, but you know you just, you just got a taxi, and you went to McDonald's, and you got yourself a Happy Meal, and you came home. That's what it's like for them to fly anywhere, paying for cab fare. I don't love that world. I don't love that world. I don't judge those people. I just don't love the world and the, sh and the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh that they have to struggle with. But the man who does the will of God 
See, he's the one that lives forever. We see the world for what it's become. We see sin for what it is. Sin's the problem. Sin is, let's describe it in three ways. Or really two ways. It's something that you do that you're not supposed to do. And it's something that you don't, that you don't do that you're supposed to do, right? Sin is God said, do this. You said, no. Sin, God said, do this. And you said, no. And he said, don't do this. And you said, I'm going to do it. It's just you in conflict with everything that God was saying because of the sinful nature. Because of the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. We're broken. It's called the sinful nature. It's the zombie virus is how I explain it. We've been infected from birth with this, 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 this image that is not exactly the way it was supposed to be. Remember, we were created holy and perfect and pure and good and so Somehow, some way, we're now born with what we call the fallen state, the fallen nature. We're infected. And because of that infection, it's the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. And it's the reason we're doing the things that we're doing. I call it a virus because it could be cured. You see, it's kind of like the COVID, right? You got the COVID and they came up with some, some cures. They're not really cures, but they came up with vaccines. And if you take the vaccine, they say, if you take this one, you're going to be 98% taken care of and protected. If you take this one, you'll be 96% protected. None of them protect you 100%, but at least you got something, right? I'm here to tell you there is only one cure for your sinful state, and that is Jesus Christ. That is putting your heart and your mind in, in, to him. You give him everything, and he's not 96%. He's not 95%, 100%. If you give your life to Christ, you will find healing. He will not leave you the way he finds you if you will embrace him. If you won't, you're still struggling with the love for this world. But it's only Jesus that brings that cure. It's only Jesus that makes that possible. We've all watched that movie with Sylvester Stallone. I don't know about all of us, but you remember Cobra? He was like a, a cop, you know, and he, he, he breaks. There's this one guy, he's got a bunch of hostages, and he goes in there and he points this gun at him, and he's this one liner, You're the disease, and, and I'm the cure. And I'm here to say that sin is the disease and Jesus is the cure and there's no other cure. There's no other name on the heaven than his name that we shall be saved from this condition that we're in. I can love that world. I don't love this world. You could read every self-help book you got. You could do this in every positive motiv motivation speech that you can do out there. You're still going to wake up in the morning. You if you want to wake up in the morning, somebody else, you have to come to Jesus and Jesus alone. Otherwise, we're dying with billions and we're dying with millions. And we're looking at people walking across the continent and we're arguing with other people on what we're supposed to do with those people. We're arguing, put up a wall, no wall, let them in, don't let them in. And nobody's out there with a sandwich trying to help these people. Nobody's looking at the nation. Why? How did it end up that way? What do we do? Do we even care? I don't love that world, but I love the world that's coming. I love the world that's promised to us. I love the vision that he shared to me and he's sharing to you that it doesn't have to be this way. And it's not always going to be this way. There is going to come a day when it's all going to change. Because when we're born again, we don't only see the world for what it was. And we don't only see the world for what it is. We can see the world for what it's going to be. Right back the way it started. Jesus is going to deal with it all. Quickly, too. Fast. Quick. In a hurry. Yeah. And we need it. I'm here to tell you, we need it. We need it. I need it. Because when that sin nature kind of like grabs a hold and starts messing with me, it begins to start messing with our relationship with people. We can care less about their needs. We can care less about their problems. All we care about is how much it costs. Not realizing that God owns everything. And if he wants you to help that person, money is going to show up. Ah, oh, don't even get me preaching about that. 
If he said do it, he's going to, do you believe he's real? Well, maybe you love the world the way it is just a little too much. Relationship with others, we rob, we steal, we cheat. Hmm. I need to flirt, turn, turn the page a moment. <laughs> you need to turn that page. It was and then another conversation with someone. We were talking about how schools need to open. And you know, I understand. I'm not against that. So please, I'm going to use school as an example, but they need to open. But what's really messing with my head is the motive behind trying to open the schools. The motive, the, the thought process is, we need to open the schools because there is something that the school offers that you cannot offer at your home. They, if they're going to develop fully into normal, whole human beings, they need to be in school because it's only the public school system that can give your kids that. You can't do it. And if they stay home any longer, they're going to grow up to be very dysfunctional. I can't handle that world. I don't even understand that world. Don't get me wrong. School offers some things, but I can offer that too. And there's some things that the school does offer that I can't offer at home. You know what that is? Being bullied. You can't offer being bullied at home. Who's bullying you? Mom, dad? Then he's abusive. He needs to go to jail. You know what I'm saying? But it's school. Anyone we'll ever get bullied in school? We got kids. We got kids committing suicide because they can't get along with each other because of the sinful nature. There's one kid over there picking on that kid over there because he doesn't like how fat, how skinny, what color his hair is. I know I've been there. I've done that. I need a cure from that sinful nature. Jesus, help me. Well, I can go on. But I won't. What about the relationship with ourselves? We all like this one, right? We, we have a problem when it comes to ourselves with the sinful nature. It's too, you fall on one of two sides, my brother. You either hate yourself so much or you love yourself too much. You, 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 and sometimes you're such a messed up, it flips back from day to day, right? I hate myself today, I love myself tomorrow. I'm depressed today, I'm a narcissist tomorrow. We, we struggle with who we are. I know I do. The other day I was watching my sermon from last week, or was it the week before? And I was coming up these stairs, and it caught me about right here, turned this way. And I had a problem with that. I looked at that and I said, oh my, I got to talk to Josh about not turning the camera on until I get right here. I didn't like that at all. I don't want to pick on Stephanie and Brandy, but they, the other day we were in here taking videos and they were like, you know, Josh, could you, could you get the camera up high? Because when it's up high, you look thinner. And I'm bugging out because, you know, I'm like, you guys have lost your mind. But later on, I was thinking, well, wait a minute. Next time I do a video, like, <laughs> should I put it on a pole? How high does it need to be? And then I started wondering, is that why everybody takes pictures like this? Is that, I never understood why they did it. I, I guess I figured out now you lose 10 pounds. What does it do? Better to go? We don't love ourselves. And that's the simple stuff, but you got suicide. You, got, you just got so much. And then you got the other hand, you love yourself so much, you're a narcissist, and you've never done anything wrong. It's always somebody else's fault. You might be sitting next to that person right now. It's always their fault. Always. Never you. I hit you because this is what you said. If you didn't say that, when I got hit, it's your fault. And you think I'm crazy, but I've been in those conversations in counseling sessions. Well, if she just did what she was supposed to do, everything would be fine. And then we had, oh, I'm, I'm going to go off. I, I only got a few more minutes. Our relationship with God was affected. We don't pray like we should. We don't think about him like we should. We've turned God into this candy machine. We, devo we, we turned him into something that is good and just palatable. And he is good. And he is awesome. And that song is right. There is nothing that is better than him. But at the same time, you can't create him into something that you want. And we have. 
I'd rather him create me into something that he wants. Change me. Show me really who you are so you can change me. And the good news is everything in this world that we've been talking about is going to change. All because of Jesus Christ. All because of what he's done. It's all about Jesus. It's all about you leave here this morning with Jesus on your lips. You leave here this morning with Jesus on your mind because he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. If you deny that, and you can deny that by how you live, you can deny that by how you behave, you can deny that by what you say, but if you live like you really know he's the Messiah, you're going to be good to go. You do anything else, he calls you the Antichrist. This is about Jesus from the beginning to the end, changing something that was good that turned bad into something that's just going to be so glorious. What world are you living for? What are you really loving? Let me, let me share some scripture. In 1 John, the one we're doing, chapter 2, verse 17. Can I read some scripture to this morning? I got, I got a lot of them here. Let the word speak for itself for a second, okay? 1 John, chapter 2, verse 17. The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we should be like him. <laughs> For we shall see him how he really is. When he shows up, see, see, something's going to change in me. I'm hoping something's going to change in you too. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 58. Listen. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. That's the world that I'm loving. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. The death, the sting of, then the sorry, will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the Lord, Lord. But thanks be to God. Everybody remember that. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. And you will know that your labor, your effort, your striving... <laughs> Your pain, your sacrifice, your life will not be in vain. It's never a waste of time to live for Jesus. Live for anything else, wasted everything. You could be doing so much more with your world. Amen. Somebody say amen again. Amen. <laughs> Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 through 6. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. As clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will, not be, there will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. Then the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy. These words are true. If you jump to verse 12, behold, Jesus says, I'm coming. My reward is with me. I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Oh, you seeker friendly people out there, you're in a lot of trouble for what he has done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gate into the city. Outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexual and moral, the murderers, the idolaters, and anyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. <laughs> the spirit and the bride say, come. And let whom, him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Do you see the world that's coming? What world are you living for? What are you loving? You loving today or tomorrow? I'm loving tomorrow. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, you got, I say it again, get ready. This is just too good for me. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. And then it ends with, come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> come, Lord Jesus. What are you living for? Where's your love? Love your wife. Love your kids. Love the goodness. Oh, man, but hate the mess. Reject the mess. Embrace Jesus. Embrace Christ. He's your only help. Sins the disease. Jesus is the cure. That's the world we're supposed to love. That's the world we're supposed to be living for. That's the world we're supposed to be striving for. Not this one. This one going to change. Are you changing with it? <laughs> what world are you living in? Are you still holding on to today or are you looking forward to tomorrow? I'm looking forward to tomorrow. While I'm embracing the goodness of today. And maybe, just maybe, I'll set that along. Get up just a little early and watch that sunset with that crazy woman sitting over there. And begin to love that too. But in the midst of that, I'm loving Jesus. Amen. I'm thank you, Jesus. We're going to celebrate this morning. I want to celebrate this morning. I had two ways I could have ended this sermon and I just wasn't sure. One was to call people to the altar and so you can give your life to Christ. And then another was, let's celebrate for those of us in this room that are already in Christ. Let's celebrate everyone in this room this morning that has given their life to Jesus, all of it, so that you can celebrate because you know that you know that you know that when that trumpet sounds, you know that your body is going to rise from the dead. Isn't that what he says here? I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. Is that you guys? I write to you, fathers, because you've known him. I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God lives in you. Is that you this morning? And you have overcome the evil one. Have you overcome the evil one this morning? Amen. Then let's celebrate with me. Would you celebrate with me? Let's sing Ain't No Grave. Amen. Gonna hold my body down. Aha. Now for those of you that the grave is gonna keep you down. The altar is open while we're celebrating. Amen. Don't miss out on the ability to be born again. Amen. Don't miss out on the beginning ability to be part of that new kingdom that's coming. Amen. Just because we're singing and shouting. Praise God. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning and this time together. You're awesome and amazing. Thank you for not striking me dead while I was up here, Lord God. I appreciate that. In Jesus' name. Shame is a prison As cruel as a grave Shame is a robber He's come to take my is my redeemer lifting me up from the ground love is a power where my freedom song is found there ain't no
Because we are supposed to love. We're just supposed to love the right things. Amen? Amen? Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning and this time together. If you just have your way, bless everyone that leaves here this morning. Let Jesus be on the center of their hearts. Let us always remember that sin is the problem. You're the cure. You won't leave us the way you find us. But you'll transform us into something beautiful and great. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen.